Well, the truth is, the first time I tried VR, I thought it was awful. <laughs> there was no fidelity. There was no resolution. Very rudimentary demos. Poor pixels. You could just look around. We didn't know what to expect. I didn't feel like I saw myself in it. Five years ago, there was only an Oculus Kickstarter. If you just see how much VR has progressed since 2013. Here we are in 2018, and I'm actually painting strokes in thin air. In five years, we've gone from months of editing to 30-second cloud stitching. We've gone from button presses on a controller to having controllers that can make you feel a virtual world in your hands. When I look back, it was kind of painful, but at the same time, there's so much fun in, in that kind of endless, constant sense of discovery. No words can describe what VR can do to you. Pure magic. Inner child exploding in my head. Literally changed my life. It's pretty mind-blowing, and it's really emotional. Because there is no rule book, then we can be in there writing it. What if we could teach and share knowledge on a global level? That shared experience actually is going to no longer be about technology, but about emotion, about you know experiences, about connection between people. This is the once in a lifetime opportunity where you can be part of creating a new art form. It's part of the challenge, right? To wake up every day and think, maybe I'll discover something completely new today and help define the language of VR. We haven't even explored the first percent of what we can do in VR. What keeps us going is knowing that there is 99% more to discover. Ultimately, virtual reality is a tool, except this tool allows us to craft moments of human existence. That is, at its core, more powerful of a medium than anything that I think that mankind has ever invented before. Welcome to OC5. All right, so, so last year, we talked about how our long-term goal was to help get a billion people into virtual reality. So let's start off by checking in on how that's going. All right. Now, we have the saying at Facebook that the journey is 1% finished. And in this case, maybe not even quite. But I'm confident uh, that we're going to get there. Because just imagine uh, all the ways that being able to feel really present with someone, no matter where they are, uh, imagine all the ways that that's going to change how we communicate, how we game, how we work, almost every category of what we do. Now, I bet that almost every person here has had the experience of introducing someone to VR for the first time. And you've seen how people just can't stop smiling. Right? They're, they're giddy. They don't want to come out. You know, that it's clear that this sensation of presence is a new kind of digital experience. And you know, we're getting closer and closer to being able to easily step uh, between physical and, and virtual worlds. So for me, uh, this isn't a question of whether we're going to get there. It's how. Right? What is the exact roadmap? What are the exact next steps we need to take on the path there? And now. I think that we all need to focus on solving two important problems next. So the first is that we need to build an ecosystem that's self-sustaining, right? Where developers can afford to, well, we, uh, and we're back. All right, wonderful. The first problem we need to solve is getting the microphone to work. Assuming we can do that. Then we are on to the second problem which is building an ecosystem which is self-sustaining, where developers can afford to build uh, high-quality experiences because there are enough people who are using these platforms who are going to pay for the content. Now, the, I guess the second or the third problem, if you will, uh, is that we need to build a product uh, with a form factor that is comfortable, uh, that you can take with you anywhere you go, and that is powerful enough to run any experience we want. So all right, let's go talk about the ecosystem first. All right, so right now, uh, there are thousands of titles for VR. There's everything from art to social VR to live music. You know, it's, it's a broad enough range, so if you have a cousin uh, who's into dinosaurs, or a grandma who's into strategy games, 
who is an awesome grandma, then there's going to be something for them in VR. But you know, right now, a lot of this is indie development. Right? A lot of it is still funded directly by us to help get the ecosystem started. And some of it is big uh, studios exploring, even if it's not profitable yet. So the big question is, what is it going to take uh, for it to be profitable for all developers to build these kind of large efforts for VR. And to get to that level, we think that we need about 10 million people on a given platform. Right? So that's the threshold uh, where the number of people using and buying VR content uh, makes it sustainable and profitable for all kinds of, uh, of, of developers. And once we get to and cross this threshold, then we think that the, the content and the, the ecosystem are just going to explode. Now, Importantly, uh, this threshold isn't 10 million people across all different uh, types of VR. Because if you build a game for Rift, it doesn't necessarily work on Go or PlayStation. Right? So we need 10 million people on each platform. So with this in mind, uh, we're now directing our roadmap so that future versions of the products that we build are going to be compatible with the current ones. So when we release the new version of Rift, which, uh, which isn't today, by the way, uh, <laughs> all of the content that works for Rift uh, is going to work on that next version, too. So this means that every generation of what we build uh, is going to build towards this threshold. And once we get there, we think that the, the content and the activity in the ecosystem is just going to really take off. All right. Now, in addition to the ecosystem, we also have to make progress on the form factor. Now, if we're building products uh, that are going to run similar content across generations, then that means that we need to lock in certain key decisions now, like what the input is going to be. Right? So that way, those things can be consistent over time. So we need to ask, what are the key attributes of the ideal VR system that we want to lock in now? We've talked to a lot of people in the, in the community, people who use Rift and Go and all the other VR devices. And we think that there are a few key qualities that any VR system that gets to scale needs to have. So first, it needs to be standalone. It's that way there are no wires. Yeah. It's, that way there are no wires that are going to break your feeling of presence or anything like that, and you're going to be able to take it with you. All right, second, it's got to support hands, right? Because that's going to be how we interact with people and objects in a natural way in virtual reality. And third, it has to offer six degrees of freedom. So you can not just uh, walk around or look around, but you can also walk around and move through a virtual space just like you would in a physical one. All right, so if we can bring these three qualities together into one product, then we think that that is the foundation for the ideal form factor for VR. So we've been working on this for years now. And at Connect, for the past couple of years, uh, you've heard me talk about Project Santa Cruz. And today, we have some news for you. I am excited to announce Oculus Quest. It is shipping in the spring, and it is going to cost $3.99. This is it. This is the all-in-one VR experience that we have been waiting for. It's wireless, it's got hand presence, six degrees of freedom, and it runs Rift quality experiences. Full inside-out tracking, full freedom to move around, no cables, no external sensors, just really good positional tracking. It's got adjustable fit, so it's comfortable to wear with glasses. It's got built-in 360 audio, even better than what we shipped with Oculus Go, even without headphones. And it is shipping with touch controllers to deliver the same hand presence that you get with Rift. Now, Now, I want to take a moment to, to thank all of you who gave us feedback on this, because 
you might know that when we started working on this, we were actually planning on building a different input device. But uh, because we got so much feedback that, that the input should be the same as Rift, we went with touch. And now we're doing even more work to bring these ecosystems closer together over time. And by shipping with touch, uh, we're going to be able to work with all of you to bring a lot of the most successful games from Rift to Oculus Quest, including Robo Recall, The Climb, and Moss, just to name a few. And we're going to have more than 50 titles available for Oculus Quest at launch. All right, let's take a closer look. Oculus Quest is an all-in-one VR system. It's just you and your hands, completely free and immersed. With six degrees of freedom, state-of-the-art optics, and built-in audio, you can forget about wires, PCs, and phones. Oculus Quest is ready to play when you are. The headset relies on four ultra-wide angle sensors to map your environment as you navigate through it. And with Oculus Insight tracking, every move you make in the real world translates right into the game you're playing. Combine that with Oculus Touch controllers, and the game is at your fingertips. So when you grab, swing, or cast a spell, you'll feel the power of every gesture. The next level of VR gaming is finally here. Introducing Oculus Quest. So, so this thing is it's, it's just wonderful. All right, um, you know, you're, you're all going to be able to try it out right here uh, at OC5. And you know, some of the experiences are, are, are just really amazing. Um, you can play tennis. We have a tennis court set up. So you, know, you have one person on, on, on one side on the tennis court playing and another person on the other side in the living room. And you can see how the experience just scales up and down nicely with the amount of space that you have available. Uh, you, know, you see the ball coming. You run towards it. You, know, you, you see your hand. You hit it. You get haptic feedback. It's, it's just it's awesome. Um, you, you're going to be able to play dead and buried out there. It's, uh, it's basically like playing paintball. You, know, you get to run around with your friends, uh, ducking behind uh, virtual objects, except uh, no, no physical welt. So, uh, so that's better. Um, <laughs> all right, so this is all set up, and you're going to be able to try all this stuff out uh, right after this keynote today. <laughs> now, with Oculus Quest, uh, we will complete our first generation of VR products. So there's Oculus Go, the, the most affordable way to experience VR for the first time. There's Oculus Quest, the all-in-one VR experience that we've been waiting for. And there is Rift, for experiences that need a PC to push the edge of what's possible. So from here, uh, we're going to make some big leaps in both tech and content for the future generations of each of these products. We're going to build each of these as platforms, so everything that you build for them today is going to work on future versions of, of, of these devices. Uh, this is all still early, uh, but this is the basic roadmap. This is what we need to do uh, for VR to succeed and to get to the future that we all want. Now, th the next few years are going to be a really exciting time uh, for VR and AR, and I'm really excited to see uh, what we all build together. Uh, so as always, thank you all for coming out to OC5. It is great to be on this journey with you. And now I want to introduce Boz, uh, someone I've worked with for more than 10 years, uh, who's been a part of building uh, many of Facebook's most important products, and who I often ask to take on the most important long-term areas that we have. And he's now leading all of our efforts in AR and VR. So I'm going to hand it off to Boz to share more about our vision. All right, thanks, and enjoy OC5. <laughs> Just under a year ago, I was sitting in the audience, right over there, attending my very first Oculus Connect. I had just joined the AR VR organization. And uh, I heard, got to hear Mark talk about Dorothy and Echo Arena and the power of virtual reality. And about two thirds of the way through his talk, this flashed on the stage. And I just thought how odd it was that Mark had never mentioned this to me in any of our conversations before I joined. I guess it just slipped his mind. It's a true story. 
But I've been at Facebook a long time, so I'm not unfamiliar with goals like these. But we've never faced anything like we're facing in AR and VR right now. We are in the early stages of a tremendous platform shift, bigger than the shift from web to mobile. In fact, it's not just a shift in the computing platform. It's a shift in how humans will connect. Let's put that shift in historical perspective. The history of technology is nothing if not the history of humans trying to connect. We domesticated horses and bridled them. Uh, we built trains across the wilderness. We laid thousands of miles of copper under land and sea. We've invented cars. We flew planes across continents and oceans, all to connect. Facebook itself is nothing if not a small step forward in that grand historical march. Yet with all of our technological progress, we still have tremendous limitations on our ability to connect. And the biggest limitation is physics. There is simply no substitute yet for being there. Physical distance becomes emotional distance. And what we've come to understand is that distance isn't always measured in miles. Sometimes it's measured in missed moments. Now, nothing has been better at breaking down the barriers imposed on us by physics than the phone. The phone is the greatest computing device ever invented, sitting atop centuries of human progress. But despite all its greatness, all that it's given us, all that it offers, we are approaching the limit of what the phone can do for us. Think about the last time you did a video call with your grandmother, your college roommate. I mean, first of all, video calls are like an event. You've got to plan it. You've got to schedule it. You've got to sacrifice your left arm to get a decent angle once you're on the call. And if you're with somebody physically with you, they better stand behind you or they're not on the call. Now, this is better than nothing, but it's not rich in the way that we know human connection can be rich. You know, we're using these tiny windows to reach out and connect with people. And as a society, we've just maxed out whatever bandwidth these little devices can provide. We can do better. So what would it take to feel transported to another place? The tools that we're building in AR and VR have the opportunity to answer this. You know, we see the opportunity in video presence, where we think there's a chance to build a platform for the home that enhances people's ability to connect. We'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. But of course, we also can be transported and feel present in virtual reality. This map shows the two and a half billion people that Facebook connects. This is what those connections look like on Oculus today. We have a, <laughs> we have a little bit of work to do. But we are starting to realize the promise. It's not the number of connections that matters most. It's the depth of those connections. That's what VR and AR will be able to do better than anything that has come before. That's why Facebook is so committed to this work. VR is often depicted as isolationist or escapist. And that dystopian future is a real possibility if we don't put people first, if we don't put human connection first. Today, the focus may be more on content, and that's great. But in the fullness of time, I expect virtual reality to be a platform primarily centered around human connection. Looking five or 10 years down the road, this could have really profound impacts on the fabric of society. You know, people often think of virtual reality as a competitor to telepresence. It's not. It's a competitor to real estate. Cities and roads are occupied by the space companies need to connect their employees face to face. Shockingly, this is not a misappropriation of our precious time and space, because that is how valuable it is for humans to connect in person. If you could enable even a fraction of that to be done remotely through virtual reality, you will have done tremendous good in allowing society to reallocate some of its most limited resources. Not only would people be able to connect with the people that matter most to them in real life because they're commuting less, but this would also enable access to jobs to those who today have limited opportunity due to geography. This potential to transform the global landscape is incredible, and it's the reason that we're prioritizing the investments to deliver this technology in a human-centric way. 
You're all already familiar with Oculus Rift, which has been powering great VR experiences uh, with PCs for years now. Earlier this year, we announced Oculus Go, which is focused on entertainment and social use cases and is by far the most affordable way to get into virtual reality. And as you've just heard Mark announce, we are excited next year to launch Oculus Quest. But you're not stopping there. We're also going to work on future technology that will unlock even more. Instead of taking the real world and overlaying virtual objects on top of it, like we plan to do with augmented reality, you can also take real world objects and integrate them into virtual reality so that everything can interact. This is super important for unlocking future use cases like reimagining how we collaborate at work. What you're about to see is actual footage from a prototype of mixed reality shot with the Oculus Quest. So as I put my headset on, we can see the virtual world uh, overlaid on a very, very crude reconstruction of the real world behind it. And here I'm watching a video of my son and I playing with iron powder and a birthday candle for Science Saturday when I get a notification that my wife sent me some photos on Messenger. And I can go in and browse and pick out a few favorites before it's time to get back to work. The top of my to-do list is to work on my OC5 script, so I better get to it. You can see that I'm able to access my real-life keyboard and desk in front of me while enjoying the boundless space that virtual reality affords me. And then I get a notification that tells me I've got a meeting, my speech will have to wait. I make my way into a virtual room somewhere in the metaverse that allows me to work alongside my team in a persistent environment. Someday there will be people in here, lots of people, imagine it. <laughs> and here comes my colleague now. Now this is a, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm just gonna assume that applause is for how cute my kids are, so I just. This is a very early concept, uh, but the ideas are starting to take shape. Being able to connect with people both physically proximate to you and physically distant at the same time has the potential to tremendously broaden our capacity to connect with other people especially if you can have access to all of your information without constantly having to check your phone. Mixed reality won't be ready for a while, but it is on our roadmap. We think it's a huge part of the next five years of virtual reality and an important step on the path to augmented reality. This work is bigger than Facebook. If you're sitting in the audience like I was a year ago, then you have been on this journey with us probably longer than I have. And I hope you do take this opportunity to step back and remind yourself of the tremendous opportunity we have to impact the world. I really think this work is important to the future of human connection. And that's why Facebook is all in on solving these problems, and we hope that you are too. And with that, I'd like to introduce Hugo Barra to talk about our work in VR. Thank you. Good morning. And wow, I'm always blown away by the energy in this room and in this community. Welcome everyone to OC5, our fifth Oculus Connect. That's right. We have so much to share today, but before we get started, I wanna give a special welcome to a very special group here with us this morning. Uh, there are about 50 of you here today, and you know who you are our most dedicated developers and creators who have attended all five Oculus Connects. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your hard work and your dedication over the years. And thank you for continuing to believe in the power of VR. And another special welcome to those watching the keynote together live in VR in Oculus venues. Yeah, we're streaming in 180 video, so it should feel almost like you're here with us in the room. Which brings me to our mission at Oculus. Our mission is to defy distance. And to deliver on this mission, we need to build hardware, software, and of course, an entire developer ecosystem that brings this new medium to life. And that is where you come in. Over the last five years, we've been building VR products and platforms to bring more people into VR. And our goal is to help you find your audience on the right platform and build a business. 
Oculus Go is our first all-in-one VR headset and the most affordable way for people to experience VR for the first time. Here at Connect, we'll share what we learned from Oculus Go so far and what we're doing to bring even more compelling content to this platform so we can continue to grow this audience. Oculus Rift and Touch remain the gold standard for high-end VR experiences and our test bed to push the boundaries of what's possible. Today, we're going to share with you a few new developer features and then follow up with a number of technical and design talks here at Connect from both Oculus folks as well as many of you from our community. And finally, Oculus Quest is our first all-in-one VR headset that brings the magic of Rift to a mainstream product that appeals to an even wider audience. This is a new category for VR, and in the next two days here at Connect, we're going to share with you everything you need to get started. So let's dive in. And we're going to start by taking a look at what some of our top Rift developers have been working on lately, kicking off with a super high energy film that celebrates this awesome community. Check it out. The difference with you and me is I seize the moment and you with that foolery. Shine like the jewelry. Hit them like boom, what you gonna do to me? But you won't ever be me, and I'll be out so fast that you won't ever meet me. Don't hate it, I'm the greatest. Take a slug, bro. You should see me out in Vegas. It's no opposition. Myself is the only competition. So slam, bow, bam, boom. The king is here, make some damn boom. Oh. Now that's how you change the game. Aye. That's how you change the game. Now that's have come a long way since Rift launch. In just two and a half years, you've given us over 1,100 Rift titles. And we're already working with developers on games launching well into 2020. The market is growing. And with Touch being the standard for sixed off gaming, there are more opportunities for people to compete, conquer, and connect in your games. Just look at Orbis VR, one of VR's first and most successful MMOs, where players have spent over 440,000 hours since the game's launch in December. Even more remarkable is that this game was built by a team of two working remotely. With a growing community and eager fans wanting more, Orbis VR is launching a massive expansion early next year with beautiful new visuals, highly customizable avatars, and much more. I'd also like to give a shout out to Space Bullet, creators of Vox Machina. Join up to 16 players as you pilot a giant robot in this super mech simulator and lead your team to victory. The team of three behind this game received one of the first Oculus grants we ever gave in 2014. And they've come a long way. So we're excited to announce that they are launching today. Congrats to the team. In 
Even though we're still in the early days of VR, many developers are on their second, third, and even fourth Rift titles. They are building on top of what they've learned, producing bigger and better games and defining the language of VR gaming. Like Ubisoft, who was one of our first VR adopters. They gave us Eagle Flight, Werewolves Within, Star Trek Bridge Crew, and Transference. And later this year, they're launching Space Junkies. Yeah. Get excited, guys. Come on, this is awesome stuff. Space Junkies is a first-person multiplayer space shooter where you gear up with insane weapons and battle your opponents in intense zero-gravity duels. Insomniac Games has also given us a lot of enjoyment over the years, from Edge of Nowhere to Feral Rights and The Unspoken. And coming in 2019, get excited for Stormland. Stormland's a hardcore experience that players have been waiting for. This action-packed adventure game lets you walk, run, climb, and even glide over an expansive open world that evolves over time. Finally, let's talk about Ready at Dawn, <laughs> a studio known for jaw-dropping visuals and character-driven narratives. Ready at Dawn has created one of the first made-for-VR franchises. They started with award-winning Lone Echo, which defined what compelling character interaction in VR feels like. It became one of the highest rated titles among press and players alike. Then they expanded with Echo VR, which invited players into glorious zero-gravity battles in Echo Arena, and coming later this year, Echo Combat. So, what's next? Well, Jack and Commander Liv are back. So let's drop into Jack's point of view and get a sneak peek at what they've been up to since Lone Echo. Jack? Jack, can you hear me? How did we end up here? You are the only person who calls me Jack. Is that your way of saying you're going to miss me? Anomaly detected. I'm gonna get you patched up. I promise. Not to jinx it, but I think we're actually making progress here. Oh, damn it! I don't know if I can do this, Jack. Your systems are failing. I barely managed to keep your core memory alive. <coughs> Are you injured? What the hell is this? Jack, please. Good morning, sunshine. Jack! Oh, thank God. Captain Rhodes, report to observation. Don't. Rift powers the most expansive, bold, and groundbreaking games in the world. And for these games to succeed, we need a robust ecosystem to bring the community together. So to talk more about Rift, I'd like to welcome Lucy Chen. All the experiences you just saw are only possible with the power of Rift. And we want to continue to connect our developers with our community of players. That's why we spent this past year rebuilding the Rift platform entirely from scratch. It's a whole suite of new tools to help you connect with each other and play the games you love. Let's dive in. Last year, we revealed two of the major changes. Home has transformed from this static storefront to your personalized corner of the metaverse, planets and all. 
We also introduced Dash, your new system interface, your command center that follows you throughout your journey and gives you full access to your PC desktop, all inside Rift. And we're excited to announce that the new Rift platform is rolling out to everyone starting today. <laughs> On top of Home and Dash, we'll get a suite of new features to help with, coming, to help with customization, social, and discovery. Let's start with customization. Home is now your space to fully personalize, thanks to hundreds of new items, decor, and environments. You can easily grab objects and place them wherever you want. This mid-century modern tropical collection is my personal favorite. Check out my pink palm trees and Florence the Flamingo. As you can see, home comes stocked with a huge catalog of items to show off your personality. But what's more personal than the games you love? And developers, we know you want to bring your own IP right into home. And that's why we're introducing custom developer items. <laughs> Devs have already created items from your favorite games, like Echo Arena, Superhot, and Moss. And soon you'll be able to earn even more. Just imagine playing Brass Tactics and getting this awesome, fully animated airship to showcase directly in your space. Or even custom clothing for your avatars. The options are endless, and we can't wait to see what you create next. OK, so home is now more personal and connected to the games you love. But to truly feel at home, you need to be able to share your space with friends. Today, you can invite your friends to come over and even set up a home theater. Just broadcast your desktop from Dash, and you and your friends can sit back and watch a live stream or the trailer of Stormland. Now, these Hangouts have to feel like you're really there with other people. That's why we revealed avatars in 2016. And since then, we've made them look more human and added hundreds of new outfits, skin tones, hairstyles, and accessories. Developers can also use their avatars to make their games more social and dynamic. Many games like Brass Tactics and Poker Stars VR have already adopted our avatar SDK. And we want to make these tools even easier to use. This summer, we added the most requested feature from devs, cross-platform support, so you can take our avatars everywhere you publish, including Steam. And we're not done yet. <laughs> and we're not done yet. Coming later this year, expressive avatars. <laughs> Last year, we gave you a glimpse into what we were building. And you might remember my friend Will. Hello again. I'm Will. And I'm delighted to present our new expressive avatars. As you can see, Will has a whole new look. The glasses are finally coming off so you can look into each other's eyes. With our research into simulated eye and mouth movement and micro expressions, it feels so much more natural to interact in VR. With all of these updates, Home's social foundation makes it easier to connect with friends and the games you love. But oftentimes, your journey starts even before you put on your headset. The Oculus desktop app is now more personalized, so you can find the most relevant games and stay connected with friends. But what about when you're away from your computer? Currently, there's a mobile app for Oculus Go. And starting today, the mobile app supports Rift. Rift users, you'll get access to discover events, connect with friends, browse a store, and even remote install new games directly to your PC. No more waiting. This is a taste of Rift's connected platform, where your games 
and friends are more within reach. From this foundation, Rift has the potential to unlock so much more. We're already seeing people using Rift for work. Our platform has inspired many developers to build new use cases. Iris VR lets architects jump right in at any point during development, so they could preview an entire job site. Skydance Interactive used Medium to build their newest game, Archangel. Previously, concepting something like this custom cockpit would take up to six months, and the team would still have to guess how things would look in VR. But with Medium, the 3D designs took only a week. These are just two examples of many native apps improving workflows across industries. And while not all desktop software has a VR version yet, Dash already brings your PC displays into Rift. And we want developers to use this technology. Introducing hybrid apps. Yes, get excited. It's an entirely new way to bring 2D applications into VR. With a few APIs and a VR viewport, Dash brings software into first-class VR applications. To see what this could look like, we partnered with Algorithmic Labs on an experimental version of Substance Painter. Many artists today use their app to paint 3D models on desktop. But with hybrid app support, artists can move seamlessly from 2D into VR. As you can imagine, manipulating a model in 3D space is so much easier. Just look at how the textures are coming to life on Toby the robot. And Dash automatically brings in all the UI, so it's the same workflow, but now in a 3D space. It's that simple. One app across desktop and VR. With hybrid apps, just imagine all the ways VR will transform workflows, even your own daily workflows, from 3D animation and CAD tools to photo editing and design. It's still early days, but we'd love to hear from you. Stop by your session this afternoon and stay tuned for more. This is year three for the Rift platform, and the best is yet to come. So now, let's take a look at Oculus Go, where entertainment is front and center. It's been just five months since we launched Oculus Go, our first all-in-one VR headset. Oculus Go is the easiest way to get into VR, and people from around the world have been excited to experience it. 
In fact, 80% of Oculus Go owners are new to our ecosystem. And it proves that a quality device at the right price gets more people into VR. But what really brings this device to life is over 1,000 apps built by you. People are solving puzzles in a tech-fueled future in virtual virtual reality by tender claws. They're taking wild rides in coaster combat by force field. They're feeling the rhythm in thumper by drool. And they're challenging their friends with Anchar Online by Oswe Games. We worked hard to pack Oculus Go with performance optimizations so that you, our developers, can build awesome experiences like these. We've talked before about dynamic clocking, fixed foveated rendering, and 72 hertz support. And now we're enabling a hardware-based chromatic aberration correction so all apps on Oculus Go will look clear at the edges with no cost to frame rate. We continue to improve across the stack so it's even easier to develop applications. And one title I'm super excited to play is Covert by White Elk. It's a social co-op game where you and a friend pull off epic heists. While one player is in the headset, the other is on their mobile device, and it's a unique game mechanism that's tons of fun. We've heard from people over and over again that they want to experience games with friends. So we're making that possible for even more apps on the platform. Coming soon, casting. Your friends will be able to follow along as you take on the zombie horde in Z-Strike or catch a rare fish in bait. First, it's coming to mobile. And soon, you'll be able to share the fun with multiple friends all at once right on your TV. We also hear from Oculus Go owners that they love using it to watch movies, concerts, and TV shows because Oculus Go feels like a personal theater. You can catch the Hunger Games on a 180-inch screen, attend a concert from the National right in the front row, or watch The Handmaid's Tale in a virtual living room. I will say this is a little intense. I've tried to cover the screen at times with my hands, but uh, the headset's attached to your face. <laughs> We want to give people even more ways to watch their favorites on Oculus Go. And I'm excited to announce that launching on Oculus Go is YouTube VR. <laughs> With over 800,000 VR videos, there's something for everyone. Take a look. YouTube VR joins the lineup of incredible media partners on Oculus Go. So whatever you want to watch, you can slip on a headset and enjoy. When you're watching the best entertainment, what's better than seeing it live with the whole community of fellow fans? In May, we launched Oculus Venues, a new way to watch live concerts, sports, and more in a virtual stadium. Let's give a shout out to everyone watching this keynote in Oculus Venues today. <laughs> Already we've hosted more than 80 live events in Oculus Venues. And today we're excited to share our fall lineup, including new live music, a horror movie marathon, and even more of our favorite stand-up comedy. 
Plus, for the first time in Oculus venues, NBA games are coming this fall. And everyone who attends an NBA game in venues will unlock an NBA avatar jersey that's yours to keep and wear with pride for the rest of the season. It's one more way we're adding to an awesome experience in Oculus venues. From courtside seats to the virtual living room, Oculus Go is opening up ways for us to enjoy our favorite media and spend time with friends like never before. What's even better, it's opening more eyes to the power of VR. And for all of us, that means more opportunities to build a new generation of VR for everyone. Now it's back to Hugo to talk about the next frontier of VR games. Thanks. Cherry down there. Nice job, nice job. Nice. Cut up, cut up. Yeah, there you go. Whoa. 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 Oh, we jumped forward wide. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Okay, I'm back, everybody. Sit together, all right? Whoa! Whoa! Whoa. Wow. For decades, people have been organizing themselves in communities built around games. From arcade cabinets in the 80s to the latest Battle Royale, games are no doubt one of the biggest forms of entertainment in the world. And they drive meaningful connections between both people who play and people who watch others play. Now, VR brings an entirely new level of immersion to games. And most importantly, it creates new and deeper ways for people to connect. Two years ago, Oculus Rift set the gold standard for games in VR with six degree of freedom tracking and hand presence with touch controllers. Now, not everybody has access to a high-end PC, of course. So since the beginning, we've been asking ourselves, what would it take to be free of the PC and get the magic of Rift into a single portable VR headset? Well, it took us three years of hard work, and now we're ready to unveil Oculus Quest. Yes, yes is right. <laughs> Finally, right? Our first all-in-one VR headset with positional tracking and touch controllers. It combines everything we learned in our journey with you, the immersion of Oculus Rift with the convenience of Oculus Go into a revolutionary VR product made for games. And as Mark shared earlier, Oculus Quest launches this spring for $3.99. The feeling that you get from an all-in-one six-stop headset is, is that of freedom to move around and explore, to turn 360 degrees without limits. But it's actually more than that. You know, it's really a new type of feeling. I feel it's kind of like having superpowers. You know, over the past few months, um, wherever I went in the world, I always tossed a Quest headset, my backpack. And I gave demos to like dozens of friends and family all over the globe. And let me tell you, every single one of them had a blast. 
And because Quest is so portable and convenient, it easily turns VR into the life of the party. And it, it adds a whole new dimension to this idea I was talking about earlier of building community around games. We've also had some of the most talented developers in the world exploring what's possible and what they can build on Oculus Quest. And here's what they have to say. We've always dreamt of being able to like step inside the game and Oculus Quest gives us that experience. I would describe Oculus Quest as VR with freedom. This untethered experience is a huge step forward for VR. It felt more free roaming, felt like it suddenly was new for me again. You don't feel like you're being yanked back like you're a diver underwater. Oh my god, it's such a bad immersion joke. <laughs> Seeing is believing, and when you experience it firsthand, you start to see the possibilities. This solves all my problems with VR right now. I don't have to think about where the boundaries of the world are. You are the avatar. You're in the game. Oh, it's magic. This is exactly what we need. I can't wait. <laughs> this isn't real. This is like some witchcraft, right? Witchcraft has become a reality. <laughs> okay. Now, we really think we're onto something significant here. For the first time, you can deliver Rift-like experiences to a much wider audience. Sixdoff and Touch are now the definitive standard for VR games, and Oculus Quest is the first VR headset in this new category. Moving forward, we are going to invest significantly in this new platform. Now, I want to give you a look under the hood of Oculus Quest. And I want to start by talking about the real computer vision magic that makes it all possible. Over the last three years, the Oculus team has built revolutionary inside-out tracking knowledge, technology. That's what we call Oculus Insight. Insight uses four ultra-wide-angle sensors and advanced computer vision algorithms to track your exact position in real time without any external sensors. It's thanks to this technology that you can move around freely, fluidly, and fast with Oculus Quest. It's really cool. Now, let's take a look at how Insight works. First of all, it uses the four wide-angle sensors on the headset to look for edges, corners, and pretty much any distinct feature in the environment. It then builds a three-dimensional map that looks like a sparse point cloud. These are the green and blue dots that you see here. The system combines this map with gyroscope and accelerometer input and generates a very precise estimate of your head position every millisecond. Insight is a very flexible and robust system. It relies on all the different features in the environment for tracking, so floors and ceiling, walls, rugs, art on the wall, window fixtures, curtains, you name it, and even furniture. Now, this flexibility is important, particularly in more challenging environments, like, for example, a room with a super shiny floor or with bare white walls with no texture, with nothing on them. And we've tested Oculus Insight in hundreds of different home spaces, and we're going to continue to do that to fine-tune it over time. Now, many of you have built room scale experiences for Oculus Rift. Oculus Insight goes beyond room scale, and it works in much larger spaces without any external sensors. Yeah, in fact, check, check this out. In fact, we have an arena scale demo right here at Connect in the innovation zone that really shows this in action. This thing, I'll tell you, this thing is 4,000 square feet. <laughs> That's right, OMG is right. Um, Anyway, you should, definitely, you should definitely check it out. All right, so Oculus Insight, Oculus Insight also powers the Guardian system on Oculus Quest. 
Just like on Rift, Guardian is what helps keep you safer while you're in VR. And Oculus Insight supports multi-room Guardian. So, <laughs> I love this guy. So, you can easily take your headset to different parts of your home, your friend's home, or your office, and it will remember the Guardian setup for each of those spaces. Pretty cool, right? Okay. Um, this tech is really sick. Oculus Insight also tracks the touch controllers that ship with Oculus Quest. And thanks to your feedback, the touch controllers on Quest share full input compatibility with Rift. With the same buttons, thumbsticks, and sensors to accurately deliver hand presence, what Mark was talking about earlier. That, this means that everything that you've learned and that we've learned and invented in game design for Rift applies to Oculus Quest. And it also makes it easier for you to develop titles that work across both platforms. Oculus Quest features an integrated audio system to deliver great immersive sound without headphones. And this is familiar to you. We've improved the audio system that we ship with Oculus Go, and it produces even deeper bass. It sounds amazing. Um, <laughs> Oculus Quest is the same optics, uh, has the same optics that we designed for Oculus Go, which are the highest quality we've ever made. And we're also adding lens spacing adjustment, that's what you just saw, to help maximize visual comfort. Okay. Now, over the next two days here at Connect, you'll all get a chance to experience Oculus Quest firsthand. We have multiple fully playable demos right on the show floor, like this awesome tennis demo called Tennis Scramble. And I want to show you a sneak preview of some of those right now. It looks fun, right? Well, it, it, it's, it's even more fun than it looks. Um, it, it's pretty sick. Uh, you can check out the demos right after the keynote. Uh, we have um, the tennis demos, super hot face or fears, right next to us in the main um, show floor. And uh, you'll be able to try the arena demo uh, called Dead and Buried uh, across the hall in the innovation zone. So definitely check it out. You'll have a really good time. OK. Now, all of the awesome technology that's packed into Oculus Quest is, of course, only as good as the experiences we enable you to deliver. So we have tons of tools to get you started. In fact, many of the SDKs you're already using will just work for Oculus Quest, including our platform, audio spatialization, and avatar SDKs, just to name a couple. Now, we spent years building world-class VR integration for Unreal and Unity, and these tools support Oculus Quest today. So if, if you're using our Unity or Unreal integrations, you already have what you need to build for Quest. For example, the super hot demo on the show floor here at Connect was ported from Rift to Oculus Quest by the super hot team in just a few weeks. It's also possible to develop a game using Unity for Quest and then build it for Rift with no code changes. Yeah. Now, if you want to learn more about developing for Oculus Quest, we have several sessions for you here this week, um, so check them out. And um, that's Oculus Quest, our first all-in-one 6.0 VR headset with touch controllers for hand presence, 
Oculus Insight tracking technology that goes beyond room scale and supports multi-room guardian. Integrated audio with improved bass and best in class optics. And what you're seeing today is just a start. We're planning over 50 high quality titles available at launch. And our launch lineup will be an impressive showcase of what we've all learned together over the years. And we hope it inspires all of you to build what you've always imagined. We're gonna share the full lineup next year. And in the meantime, we wanted to give you a sneak peek at something very special we've been working on with one of the most innovative and award-winning award teams in the universe. Please welcome executive in charge at ILM X Lab, Vicky Dobbs Beck. Welcome, Vicky. Thank you, Hugo. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here on behalf of ILM X Lab and Lucasfilm. <laughs> As many of you may know, ILMX Lab is Lucasfilm's immersive entertainment division. We extend the Star Wars universe through emerging technologies like virtual reality. And our goal is for fans to literally be able to step inside our stories. We've been pushing the boundaries of storytelling, most recently with Carne y Arena, that was directed by Alejandro Inaritu and produced by Legendary Entertainment. It's the first ever virtual reality project to garner a special Oscar. And Star Wars Secrets of the Empire, our award-winning hyper-reality experience created in collaboration with The Void. ILM X Lab and Oculus are like-minded in our ambition to evolve the premium immersive space. We're creating compelling stories designed to take advantage of the medium. Case in point, Oculus contributed significantly to the hardware that has brought Star Wars Secrets of the Empire to life. As we look toward the future, we want to tell connected stories, stories that cross the boundaries of home and locations, and that deepen our experiences with beloved characters in a galaxy far, far away and beyond. We continue to build a world-class team at ILM X Lab, and as a part of that effort, we work with key creative partners. And so I'd like to welcome on stage writer and executive producer for Star Wars Secrets of the Empire, my friend, David S. Goyer. Thanks, Vicki. So, working on a groundbreaking interactive experience like Star Wars Secrets of the Empire, it was an incredible opportunity for me, but it was always part of a larger narrative plan. So over the past few years, I've been working closely with ILMX Lab and with the Lucasfilm Story Group to create connected stories for the virtual reality space. At Star Wars Celebration in 2016, we announced that we were working together on a virtual reality project about one of the most iconic characters in the Star Wars universe, Darth Vader. Since then, we've been working with David on this series. Oculus embraced our vision, and today I'm really excited to announce that Oculus is our premier partner for the series. Together, we will make it a reality for the VR community and Star Wars fans worldwide. As creators, we are designing the experience to take full advantage of Oculus Quest 6 off fully immersive VR without cords or the need for a PC. Imagine, you'll be able to step inside the world of Star Wars in the comfort of your own living room and for the first time, truly feel free. So, 
Our three-part series was built from the ground up to be immersive first, meaning that we designed it to only be experienced in virtual reality. The story is set up by the events of Star Wars Secrets of the Empire, and it takes place between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope. In this experience, you'll be able to travel to the fiery planet Mustafar and actually enter Darth Vader's castle, which was first seen in Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. You'll get an up-close look into the mind of one of the world's most infamous villains. Even better, you'll actually get to take an active role in this as-yet-untold story. So with that, we're really excited to share the first glimpse of Episode One, debuting as a launch title on Oculus Quest. Let's take a look. There's something wrong, Captain. I need you in the cockpit now. Wow. I've seen this video about 25 times, and I get serious goosebumps um, literally every time I see it again. Uh, we could not be more excited for these worlds to come together and for you to be at the center of this groundbreaking Star Wars series. It's going to be awesome. All right. We've covered a ton of stuff this morning. Amazing new titles coming to Oculus Rift, including Lone Echo 2, Vox Machina, and Stormland. Also on Rift, we're making Oculus Home and Dash available to everyone today with the Rift platform now officially out of beta. Plus, new developer features coming soon, including custom developer items and expressive avatars. On Oculus Go, we're really excited to have YouTube VR launching soon, and NBA games coming this fall to Oculus venues. Plus, casting, a big feature request that will make Oculus Go even more fun and social for everyone. And of course, we gave you a preview of Oculus Quest, our first all-in-one sixth-off VR headset that brings the magic of Rift to a mainstream product. And we can't wait to see what this community is going to start building for it. After unveiling Quest, we have now completed our first generation portfolio of VR headsets. These are going to become the established platforms where you will find your audience and build your business. And at Oculus, we're going to continue to invest in heavily in technology for future generations of products on these three platforms. And of course, speaking of the future, leading the team that's pushing the boundaries of VR and AR forward is an Oculus Connect favorite and my friend, Michael Abrash. He's the, he is the one person among the rest of us mere mortals, um, who's become famous for his ability to predict the future. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome Michael. You know, every year when Connect rolls around and I get up on this stage, I remember once again just how special it is to be here. Because I look out at all of you, and what I see is the future. I see a remarkable collection of talented, creative, visionary people. 
the kernel from which the most important technology of the next 50 years will grow. I can feel the tremendous potential of VR just waiting for us to make it real. And that's why one of my favorite things in the world is talking about the future at Oculus Connect. Today is the fourth time I've had the privilege of giving a Connect keynote, and as I was thinking about what I'd like to share with all of you, I realized that this was the perfect opportunity to look back at what I've said about the future and see whether it still holds up. So let's take a stroll down memory lane. At the first Oculus Connect, I told you that VR was going to change the world. Although we're not there yet, I'm more certain than ever that that will happen. VR and AR, which, as I'll discuss later, will soon start to converge, are together going to replace personal computers and mobile as the primary ways humans interact with information and with each other. At OC2, I talked about how these are the good old days, because we're VR pioneers creating the future, a rare privilege that is all too often only appreciated in retrospect. And I talked about the key technology areas that would have to come together to take VR to the next level. Three years later, I'm even more confident about all that. In my opinion, these are absolutely still the good old days, and they're actually going to get even better. Not only are we still creating the future, but over the next few years, we're going to see the rate of change accelerate sharply, and the future we're creating is going to be brighter than I predicted. As for the key technology areas, at OC3, I made specific predictions about where they would be in five years, and that's what most of today will be about. And yes, in case you're wondering, I do wear a blue shirt every day. <laughs> It does not pay a profit to be too specific. Overall, my two-year predictions are looking pretty good, but I was perhaps a little more specific than I should have been, not about the technologies themselves, but about their timing. I think most of what I talked about will be in consumers' hands a year later than I thought, four years from now rather than three. But apart from that, not only are the predictions still on track, it's actually starting to look like I underestimated in some areas. I'll review my predictions in detail and update them a little later, but before I dive into that, I'd like to talk a bit about creating the future, starting with a quick story. As I described at OC3, back in 1995, John Carmack asked me for a second time to join him at id to write Quake, and this time I was ready to make the move. However, I'd never been to Texas, and I'd never met anyone else from id, so I took a trip down to Dallas to check things out. At some point during that trip, John and I went to Tia's Tex-Mex for lunch. By that point, I had decided to take the job, but I was not all that confident about my ability to do what John expected me to do. I had just climbed a mountain in shipping Windows NT, and Quake looked to be a much higher mountain, with no one but the two of us to write the code, and I was wondering if I would be able to hold up my end of the work. And actually, while it's not part of this particular story, feedback was not one of its strengths. So I kept wondering whether I was living up to John's standards for a full six months after I started. If you've ever seen the movie The Princess Bride, there's a bit about Wesley being captured by the dread pirate Roberts, who initially spares him, but who tells him every night, good night, Wesley, good work, sleep well, I'll most likely kill you in the morning. <laughs> every evening, as I drove home, I felt like John would most likely fire me in the morning. <laughs> then one day, out of the blue, he said, everybody's happy with the work you're doing. What I didn't say then, but definitely thought, was that it was nice to finally know that I didn't walk away from all those Microsoft options and drag my family halfway across the country for nothing. <laughs> Happily, in the end, working on Quake turned out to be one of the best experiences of my life. Anyway, after lunch, as I walked out to the car with John, I said that every time I start a challenging new project in an unfamiliar area, I wonder if I'm actually capable of doing something that hard hoping he'd say something sympathetic or reassuring. John turned to me and said, I never wonder that. <laughs> Which is part of what makes John John, and part of why you should listen to every word of his keynote tomorrow. But while John would probably have no problem with the Dread Pirate Roberts, uncertainty is difficult for the rest of us. We mere mortals are far more comfortable iterating on what we're familiar with than plunging into the unknown, and it's much easier to follow taillights than it is to blaze new trails. That's especially relevant for VR, where we're all blazing new trails. It's hard for us not only technically, but also psychologically. That's just human nature. 
but it's also far more satisfying to dive into the unknown and succeed. The breakthrough work we did at id was far more personally rewarding than if I had gone through another cycle of polishing Windows NT. For me, at least, work is satisfying in proportion to its impact and originality. And when it comes to impact and originality, VR and AR are as good as it gets. When I say that we're creating the future, I mean that literally. The world our children and grandchildren live in will be defined by the work we're doing today. Technological waves like VR and AR don't just happen. They're driven by a critical mass of smart, motivated people with a vision, people like all of us together. So please keep that in mind as you encounter the inevitable obstacles and frustrations of forging into the unknown and creating the future. In that context, it's instructive to look at the PC revolution, which is the closest analogy to what we're collectively doing with VR. PCs and their mobile descendants are the core of the first great wave of human-oriented computing, the greatest change in how we live in nearly a century. That wave came together in the 70s at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, where a team of researchers took on the mission to create the office of the future and invented the laser printer, developed Ethernet, refined the mouse and developed the bitmap windowing interface, wrote the first WYSIWYG word processor, even coined the term object-oriented, and then put all that together to build the first personal computer, the Alto. Steve Jobs negotiated two visits to see the super-secret Alto in 1979. Here's what he said about that years later. And within 10 minutes, it was obvious to me that all computers would work like this someday. It was obvious. You could argue about how many years it would take. You could argue about who the winners and losers might be. You couldn't argue about the inevitability. It was so obvious. The Macintosh and Windows spread the technology park it created. Developers built the software we use today on that foundation. Moore's Law enabled computers to get much smaller and a million times faster. And the result is a world in which all of us make our living using personal computers and communicate and stay in touch with smartphones. So the first great wave of human-oriented computing didn't just happen. The foundation was created by a team with a critical mass of talent and a vision at Park, and then an ever-expanding community of developers and hardware companies built that out into the world we live in today. Now let's apply Steve's words to the second great wave, VR and AR. You couldn't argue about the inevitability. It was so obvious. Imagine a VR headset that's a sleek, stylish, lightweight visor with a 200-degree field of view, retinal resolution, high dynamic range and proper depth of focus, with audio that's so real you can't believe it's computer generated, that lets you mix real and virtual freely, that lets you meet, share, and collaborate with people regardless of distance, and that lets you use your hands to interact with the virtual world. If that existed, we'd be working, playing, and connecting in it every day. Imagine AR glasses that are socially acceptable and all-day wearable, that give you useful virtual objects like your phone, your TV, and virtual workspaces, that give you perceptual superpowers, a context-aware personal assistant, and above all, the ability to connect, share, and collaborate with others anywhere, anytime. If those glasses existed today, we'd all be wearing them right now. That's all obvious, and while it may be hard to believe, it's all doable. We really will be wearing those AR glasses and working, playing, and connecting in VR before too long. There's just one minor obstacle. The technology that would allow most of that to happen doesn't yet exist. But it will. Now, that's possible partly because there's a new, very positive twist to the future that I envision for VR. When I made my predictions two years ago, they were based on my extrapolations of the research and development work we'd been doing in VR. Since then, though, our work on AR has ramped up a great deal, and over the last two years, two important points have become clear. The first is that VR and AR have a great deal of overlap. It's always been obvious that 20 or 30 years from now, you'll just have one pair of glasses that supports everything from purely virtual to entirely real, but technology limitations, especially in the display, have forced completely separate VR and AR paths to date. For those same reasons, VR and AR products will continue to be on different paths for a while, with VR providing the richest, most immersive experience, while AR gives you all-day, socially acceptable access to information, virtual objects, telepresence, and a virtual assistant. But the technology they're built on and the functionality they provide will increasingly converge, especially as VR acquires good mixed reality capabilities. This is no longer a someday thing. It will happen over the next decade, and I expect it to start to have a major impact in four to five years. The second thing that's become clear 
is that VR can advance farther and faster by leveraging AR technology. Now, VR didn't require breakthrough technology to become product worthy. And in fact, most of what you'll find in a VR headset is modified off the shelf technology. That doesn't mean that it was easy or that current VR isn't good. It just means that when you can, for example, make a good display system using technology developed for smartphones, you don't try to develop a completely new risky display system that might be even better. But no off-the-shelf display technology is good enough for AR, so we had no choice but to develop a new display system. And that system also happens to have the potential to take VR to a different level. The same is true pretty much across the board. And it's why I said at the beginning that we're going to see the rate of change for VR accelerate sharply and that the future is going to be even brighter than I predicted. Having said that, I'll say the same thing I said two years ago. What you're going to hear is what I think and hope the future of VR will be, but what I'll discuss may or may not ever show up in a product. So with the clear understanding that these are just my opinions and that there are no guarantees, let's revisit these predictions. Here are the areas I made predictions about at OC3. Let's look at each of them in turn, starting with optics and displays. We're visual creatures, and the display is the most prominent part of the VR experience. Here's what I predicted for 2021. 4K by 4K panel resolution, 30 pixels per degree, a 140 degree field of view, and variable depth of focus. That's actually only three predictions because pixels per degree is a function of total resolution and field of view. This is a case where I clearly undershot. Many of you no doubt saw the description of the Half Dome prototype at F8. Half Dome achieved two of my three display predictions two year, three years early. It has a 140 degree field of view and varifocal depth of focus. And while Half Dome has roughly the same resolution as the Rift, 4K panels that would provide 30 pixels per degree over a 140 degree field of view have already been shown publicly, and using one in Half Dome would be straightforward. So I'm comfortable saying that I nailed this prediction. However, one thing that I didn't predict two years ago was equally rapid progress on the algorithms driving varifocal displays. Without varifocal, everything appears blurred when you look at a nearby object, such as this robot's hand, an unnatural condition that is obviously not an ideal visual experience. With varifocal, both near and far objects always appear sharp. This is also an unnatural condition that, while better, is still not an ideal visual experience. Fixing this requires rendering depth of field blur that varies depending on where you're looking, which is very challenging to do in a physically accurate manner. However, we've made significant progress on solving this problem with Deep Focus, an AI-driven renderer that can reproduce natural gaze-contingent blur in real time. Here's correct blur when looking at the robot's hand. Notice that the hand is sharp while the background is properly blurry. And here's the correct blur when looking at the far wall. In the coming months, we'll be publishing our deep focus research and making the trained networks freely available to experiment with and build upon. So Half Dome and Deep Focus are very cool, but that's just the start for optics and displays, which is the poster child for how progress is accelerating. There are actually two ways in which we're already moving past Half Dome, and both of them have tremendous potential. One of these is a technology known as pancake lenses. Pancake lenses have been around for decades, but are only now becoming truly practical. They use polarization-based reflection to fold the optic path into a very small space, which results in several advantages over the Fresnels that are currently used. For one thing, they enable much sharper images, allowing full benefit from higher resolution panels. Given the right panels, they could potentially reach retinal resolution. They can also support ultra-wide fields of view, all the way out to somewhere around 200 degrees. Finally, they enable much more compact headset form factors. That all makes pancake lenses very appealing, but I should note one limitation. You can get either a very wide field of view or a very compact headset with pancake lenses, but not both at the same time. So pancake headsets may be optimized for form factor and comfort rather than field of view, but if so, that will be a choice because they could have had an ultra-wide field of view instead. I'm not making any predictions about whether or when pancake lenses will ship, but they make it obvious that the rate of change has ramped up from what I anticipated two years ago. Remarkably, though, the long-term display technology slope is actually steepening even more thanks to AR technology. That comes in the form of waveguides, where light is injected into a thin glass plate and bounces down it, getting deflected out towards the eye a bit at a time as it bounces along. 
Waveguides are only a few millimeters thick, so it's possible to make extremely slim light displays with them. There are no inherent resolution limitations, and they could potentially extend to any desired field of view in a slim form factor, so it would be possible to build a sunglasses-like waveguide visor with retinal resolution. Here's a concept drawing, which I want to emphasize is not an actual prototype, much less a product, of what a waveguide VR headset could look like. So while something like that is still years in the future, it's so compelling that I expect it to eventually happen. So for display, not only have my predictions already come true, but I'm more excited about the future than ever. Next, we come to graphics. Here, my prediction involved foveated rendering, where rendering resolution varies across the screen to match that of the retina. Here's what might actually be rendered as the eye moves around the scene. The white square shows where the eye is looking. As you can see, detail falls off sharply away from the foveal area, and most of the scene is rendered very coarsely, saving a great deal of rendering work. This sparse rendering can then be upsampled into a normal full resolution frame buffer that is perceptually indistinguishable from a full resolution render when viewed in a VR headset. My prediction was that foveated rendering would be used to decrease the rendering load by an order of magnitude. I think that prediction will hold up, but what I didn't anticipate was how the missing pixels would be filled in. A new and very promising approach is to use deep learning to fill in the details. The generated pixels won't be exactly right, but because they're away from the fovea, that doesn't matter. What's important is that it will look right to your peripheral vision. Let's look at an example. Here's a full resolution image. Now, here's that same image with 95% of the pixels removed in a pattern that matches the distribution of resolution across the retina, assuming that the viewer is looking at the white square near the lower right. Now let's use deep learning to fill in the missing pixels. It's not exactly right, of course. A lot of detail is lost as you move away from the white square, especially if you look at the mountains and fields at the left side of the screen. Here, let's do a blink comparison to make that clearer. Here's the original, and here's the deep learning reconstruction. But those differences would be indistinguishable from the original image when looking directly at the white square in a VR headset. And the reconstructed version requires rendering only 1 20th as many pixels as full resolution. Here's a deep render learning approach applied to the sparse rendering we saw in the earlier video. If you look closely, you can see that there's fine detail only around the white square, but again, this would look exactly right to someone whose eyes are following the square. There's still a lot of work to do here, but I'm comfortable sticking with a prediction of foveated rendering within four years. The other... <laughs> the other major challenge with foveated rendering was the requirement for eye tracking. Two years ago, I predicted we'd have great eye tracking, but I thought it was a significant risk. It's still a risk, but I'm more comfortable than I was two years ago in saying highly reliable eye tracking will be here within four years. After all, it obviously works in Half Dome today, and while that's not the same as working across the entire population in a shipping product, getting the rest of the way there should be doable. I had two predictions for audio. One was that there would be solid technology for modeling the propagation of sound around virtual spaces. That is, how sound reflects, diffracts, and interferes as it bounces around. So virtual rooms would feel much more convincing, even though you might not consciously know why. The first propagation code is already on its way into product, and that will steadily improve over the next few years. The other prediction was that personalized head-related transfer functions, or HRTFs, would become a standard part of the VR experience. HRTFs describe how sound bounces off and diffracts around the head, and especially the ears, which is the key to enabling truly convincing directional sound. Now, you might think that sounds nice, but not particularly significant, kind of like a better form of stereo. And I might have agreed with you until recently. But a few weeks ago, I had my first demo with my own personalized HRTF. I put on special open-ear headphones and sat down in front of a table that had a cassette player on it. A researcher put a cassette in and turned the player on, and music started playing. She picked up the player and moved it around me, and I listened as it happened, wondering what the point of this was. I was asked to close my eyes and point to the player, and I did it successfully about a dozen times. Then she put it down and popped out the cassette, and the music kept playing. It took me a minute to understand that the player had never made any noise. The sound was entirely from the headphones, but spatialized perfectly as the player moved. 
Even once I understood that, it was so convincing that I had to lift the headphones away from my ears to prove to myself that they were really the source of the music. It was like no computer-generated audio I've ever heard before, and it was utterly convincing. Audio presence is a real thing. Personalized HRTFs are going to be a huge step forward for the VR experience, especially paired with great visuals for multimodal impact. However, they're also one of the riskier of my predictions. Obviously, they're currently doable, but the challenge is to make the process of generating them a lot easier. My HRTF was the result of a 30-minute scan of my ears, followed by a lengthy simulation, which definitely doesn't qualify as consumer-friendly. I'll stand by this prediction, but I acknowledge that it may take longer than I thought. For interaction, by which I mean the ways in which we make selections and perform actions in the virtual world, my prediction was that we'd have good hand tracking and gesture-based control of simple interfaces, with touch continuing to be the preferred mode for sophisticated interactions, and I'll stick with that. I also noted, though, that the only thing that I thought could fully displace touch-style controllers was the ability to use your hands directly, complete with haptics, to interact with objects in the virtual world, and that I didn't think that that would happen in the next five years, that, in fact, it wasn't even on the distant horizon. I still don't think it'll happen in the next four years, but something interesting may, in fact, be on the distant horizon. This is definitely a deep research problem right now, but here's a video of one experiment. I predict the first time you get to use your hands with haptics in VR it will be as much of a revelation as the first time that you put on a VR headset. Because that feedback loop from head motion to proper parallax is what creates strong presence in VR today. And I believe that that feedback loop from motor control to haptics can be equally powerful. So I don't have a four-year prediction for haptic hands, but I'll make the farthest out prediction I've ever made and say that I believe that we'll have useful haptic hands in some form within 10 years. For ergonomics, my primary prediction was untethered headsets, but I also predicted greater comfort overall. This is an area in which the AR-VR connection really shines. The reason is that, in my opinion, in order to be successful, AR glasses have to be socially acceptable, weigh no more than about 70 grams, and dissipate no more than roughly 500 milliwatts on your head. Compared to that, VR ergonomics are a piece of cake. Applying AR technology to VR, especially display, silicon, audio, and computer vision, will make it genuinely possible to build something like the visor I showed you earlier. There's also another aspect of AR that will help to enable a hyper-comfortable visor four years from now, and that's a two-part architecture. Given the thermal and weight constraints, it's not feasible to get enough compute into a pair of socially acceptable glasses to enable truly useful AR. So AR glasses will have to be linked to a companion device, either a phone or a puck, that has most of the battery and compute. VR can similarly link the headset to a companion device, and that will reduce the weight on the head drastically, vastly improving comfort and overall form factor. Better yet, VR headsets could link to the companion device wirelessly, giving you complete freedom of motion. Of course, freedom of motion in VR comes with the challenge of moving around safely, and here we come to computer vision and mixed reality. That is, freely mixing the real and virtual worlds by reconstructing the real world and bringing desired parts of it into VR. Let's look at an example of reconstruction. First, the space needs to be scanned. This can be done manually, but can also be done automatically as a person wearing a headset moves around the space, as you see here. As the headset moves, the sensors sweep around the space, cumulatively building up a model of it over time. Once the space is captured, the model can be pulled into VR and played back, mapped to the real world. It can also be broken down into its major parts. And it can be reskinned. Yeah. 
basically, at this point, real and virtual can be intermixed however you want. So that was pretty cool, but it was obviously a research video with plenty of artifacts. Can reconstruction get good enough to be really compelling? Well, here's a picture of a real apartment. Now, here's a reconstruction of that apartment done with com consumer-grade sensors. Every time I see this, I'm astonished at how realistic it looks. It's easy to see how this level of reconstruction will enable virtual teleportation and powerful mixed reality. As we saw, a model of this detail and complexity takes time to construct. Instant real-time capture and reconstruction of the real world is also possible. It won't be as complete and polished, but will let you move around safely, interact with real objects, and mix real with virtual effectively. And that will be here within four years as well. Overall, computer vision capabilities are advancing rapidly, and I'm happy to stick with my prediction of high-quality mixed reality within four years. Now, mixed reality has implications beyond just expanding the range of VR experiences. Once we have good mixed reality, VR and AR suddenly have a great deal in common. For social reasons, you're probably not going to be walking around in public wearing a VR visor any time in the near future. But otherwise, what difference does it make whether the photons showing you the real world come from the real world or from a display? In fact, mixed reality in VR is inherently more powerful than AR glasses because there's full control of every pixel rather than additive blending. VR can also provide a richer experience than AR because the display doesn't have to be see-through, the form factor is much less constrained, and it doesn't have to run off of a battery for an entire day. So the truth is that VR is not only where mixed reality will first be genuinely useful, it will also be the best mixed reality for a long time. AR's advantage, on the other hand, is that it will make mixed reality available all day, anywhere you go. But both of them will be mixed reality platforms with a great deal in common. This commonality leads to some important conclusions. If both VR and AR let you mix real and virtual, why would they have different user interfaces? Sure, they would use different controllers in different situations, but they should ultimately use the same underlying interface tailored to specific uses. Similarly, they should have the same developer environment and tools, and apps should generally work seamlessly across both, although some will obviously be better or more useful on one platform than the other. So VR and AR should converge in many ways over the next decade. And finally, we come to my last prediction, virtual humans. Truly lifelike, real-time rep virtual representations of real people, which I didn't think would land within the five-year horizon. That may still prove to be right, but this may be another case where I was insufficiently ambitious, because the rate of change is accelerating here, too. Consider the face tracking video I showed two years ago. Now contrast that with this. A good morrow to you, my boy. It's healthier to cook without sugar. Thank you, she said. It's That's hard to believe, off. but one of those is a reconstruction, not a video. Approach Can you tell which? Statuesque composure. The one on the right you, is the reconstruction. If you look closely enough, there are imperfections in the neck, you, the hair, the eyes, and the mouth. It's but it's impressively close to the real thing. Thank you, she said, dusting herself off. George is paranoid about a few This is a novel machine learning-based approach we call codec avatars. And while it's still in an early stage, if it could be made to work for everyone and included bodies and hands, it would revolutionize how we communicate and collaborate. Put it together with mixed reality, and where you live would no longer have to be tied to where you work. You could visit, really visit, with your family, even if you lived thousands of miles away. And of course, it would enable by far the best multiplayer games ever made. So I'm not betting on having convincingly human avatars within four years, but I'm no longer betting against it either. What's particularly interesting to me about the possibility of truly convincing virtual humans in the near future is that it is the last piece of the one thing I personally most want from VR. As I said two years ago, I would love to have a virtual workspace a VR environment that you could configure any way you wanted, with virtual screens, holograms, whiteboards, and whatever, then switch between configurations instantly. That's the most productive solo work environment I can imagine. And then, if we add virtual humans, it would become an amazingly productive collaborative environment as well. If all of my four-year predictions come true, and virtual humans also lands, then a virtual workspace that replaces personal computers is a done deal. The only thing that that VR system would lack is true haptic hands, and that may well show up a few years later. Now, imagine that you have that powerful virtual workspace, and then AR glasses come along and let you seamlessly access that same workspace no matter where you are. 
True, the experience won't be as good, but you'll be able to do it anywhere, in a cafe, in a meeting, in an airport, wherever you want. You'll have the best workspace in the world when you're at your desk in VR, and you'll be able to access a lower fidelity version of the same workspace anytime, anywhere in AR. That's a future I look forward to with great anticipation and one that I expect to see within the next decade. And with that, we've come to the end of my predictions. The bottom line is that things are pretty much on track. True, it will be a year longer than I thought before most of this lands, but on the other hand, some important areas are advancing faster and farther than I anticipated, so I think that's a fair trade. Four years from now, VR is going to jump to the next level, and that's just the start. Every area will continue to improve, and virtual humans and likely haptic hands will be along before too long. In short, as far as I can see, and I can see pretty far, the future of VR couldn't be brighter. We, all of us gathered together today, both physically present and in VR, are quite literally creating the future. Our work is going to have a huge impact on how people live 10, 20, 50 years from now. Think of how much the world we live in has been shaped by Xerox Park and everything that followed. What we're collectively doing now will shape the future even more powerfully. A technology wave like this comes along only once every few decades and we are all unbelievably fortunate to be here for the beginning of this one. We're positioned to connect the world in ways far beyond anything that's ever existed before and to make people more productive and their lives more fun while we're at it. Years from now, I promise you, we'll all look back on this as a golden time, a time when we literally made the future together. Thank you. <laughs>